if you'll take your outlines out, we're going to spend just a little time on where we are. And you've also, this is the, the outline we've also got in your handout. But almost, interestingly enough, doesn't really make much difference which, uh, which resource you go to. Almost every resource I found divides the book exactly as you see here. Chapters 1 and 2 dealing with Paul talking about his apostleship and also the issue of salvation by grace alone. Chapters three and four dealing with the doctrinal teaching, which we've done and that we finished in chapters three and four. And then finally, as in most of Paul's letters, we're going to get to the practical application. So Paul has said, first of all, <coughs> I'm, I've dealt with these two issues regarding my apostleship and the Galatian church. Secondly, <coughs> Here's the doctrine related to those things, and that's where he talks about the law. Um, and the law, actually, I'm going to bring, I'm going to use this term, the law, uh, the law as opposed to the law of Christ. Next week in chapter 6, we're going to get in the very first part of chapter 6, we're going to get to something called the law of Christ. So we're going to spend a little time on what that is. So Paul has done that, kind of taken the the church to task in the first two in the first two chapters then he's come back and he said okay now here's our doctrine related to that and that's where he dealt with <coughs> excuse me uh, the the argument for liberty and the and the promise of Abraham and the and the purpose of the law and then he amplified that in chapter 4 when he talked about the coming of God's son you recall the whole issue where he talks about our being heirs uh, and we ended that up with a comparison of Hagar and Sarah, which I thought was a great comparison that Paul used to differentiate between the law and the promise, the law and faith. So this last section, it's going to be on the practical issues or, or how, the how-tos, uh, practical exhortations, which is the freedom to love and to serve. And in it, he's going to deal with uh, liberty that's imperiled by legalism, liberty uh, perverted by lawlessness, and liberty as, a perf as perfected love, and then there'll be a conclusion. Um, all of those are going to be in this section. The last two will be in chapter 6. I do have to, to uh, make a correction from something I said last week. I said in chapter 6, we, the, first few chapter, or the first few verses are related to the text. And then after that, as in many of Paul's letters, he's going to have commendations for certain people. I realized later I conflated that with another one of the of Paul's letters I had been reading because there is no commendation for anybody in Galatians. In most of the rest of Paul's letters, when you get to the end of his letter, he says, uh, bless Phoebe and bless such and such and bless such and such for the work they're doing. That doesn't happen in Galatians, and you can probably understand why because this is a, of all the letters that Paul writes, um, and I would say even more so than Corinthians. First and second Corinthians are what I call Paul's recalcitrant letters because those are the letters that he really takes the Corinthians to task over their lifestyle. I think Galatians even more so because he's dealing with the very essence of what, uh, of what Christianity means and that is salvation by faith. Now let's see how, how this is going to proceed. You'll notice uh, I've got six different kind of... Uh, uh, focal points we're going to look at here and it's going to divide itself the, the chapter itself divides quite readily into two kind of two big pieces the first is verses 1 through 15 which is going to be freedom in Christ and then the latter part 16 through 25 life in the spirit and to do that he's going to hit on what I pulled out are six kind of focal points here the first being stand firm the second the whole law the third, um, and I th I'm pretty sure that Lynn did her homework assignment on antinomianism. So that's when we get to that, we'll listen to her uh, uh, homework assignment. The fourth, live by the spirit. The fifth, not by flesh. And then the sixth is probably one of the most famous um, sections of scripture. Your, that most people will talk about, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. So the question has always been in people's minds, well, how can you tell a Christian? How do you know it's a Christian? Fruit of the Spirit should be one of the best indicators. 
If you do not see the fruit of the Spirit, you might start beginning to wonder. Or if you don't see the fruit of the Spirit in you, you might start to wonder, you know, where am I in my walk? So that's where we're going to be over the next uh, oh, half hour or 45 minutes. And let me start here first with kind of an overview of chapters 5 and 6. So first of all, Paul's already dealt with two uh, important goals in his appeal to the Galatians. The first one was this. He, and you recall this in the very first chapter. He defended his apostleship. The first thing that happened from the Galatian church was the Judaizers were saying, oh, man, this guy's not even a real apostle. You can't really listen to him. Well, Paul comes back and he defends that. And he says, which one of you were personally charged by the Lord Jesus Christ to say, this is the gospel I want you to preach? Which one of you had that personal confrontation and that personal charge and the personal time spent with the Lord to say, you are an apostle. And Paul's going to make the case, I might be the, more of an apostle than all the apostles. Because you'll recall, in calling of the apostles, all of this happens during Jesus' ministry. Paul's the only one that occurs after Jesus' ministry and after the resurrection. It's called the Damascus Road experience. So the first thing he's going to, he, deal, he dealt with was that. Why don't we deal with this apostleship stuff that you guys keep hitting me with? And then the second thing he's going to deal with is the whole concept of um, the gospel. And the gospel in terms of it's by grace alone. I would make the case that Galatians has, should have been what the focal book is in terms of grace, salvation by grace, even more so than the Ephesians. Fortunately, the Ephesians really encapsulates it in just two or three verses. Galatians is the first one to make the case uh, five, six years before the book of Ephesians is even written. So Paul's already dealt with those two issues. There's one more point before he concludes the letter uh, that Paul's got to make, and that's this. Liberty of believers is not liberty that leads to license. And when we get to Lynn's homework assignment on antinomianism, we'll see what that means. So he's going to make that point in the next couple of chapters. So Christian liberty, and he's going to make this point, leads to mature responsibility and holiness before God. I, I always struggle with the word holiness, and I think that's because all of us have the picture in our mind of, <clears throat> of the angel with that little halo above their head when we talk about holiness. The, the term in both Hebrew and Greek for holy simply means to be set apart. But the important part of that is, in Deuteronomy, uh, God says to this, be holy, put in parentheses, set apart, for I am holy, put in parentheses, set apart. So what's he saying? Be set apart from all the profane things there is in the world, and there's a bunch of them, to uh, the, the standards that I set to my holiness. And the term always applies in two respects. One, be set apart from something and be set apart to something. So when you see the word holiness, um, don't do what I did for years and years and years and get the image of the little angel with the halo of his head. Get the, the image of being set apart from everything that's profane in society. So he's going to make the point that you no longer have 613 laws and requirements to be the fence for, what you, for, for defining holiness because that was completed in Jesus. But that does not mean that somehow you have run of the mill, you can go do whatever you want to. So he's going to make that argument here in the next few verses. And that's going to bring us to our first focal point, and that's to stand firm. So I'm just going to, I'm going to read pieces of chapter 5. I hope that either before or after the class, hopefully before, that you're reading through the chapter so you have a little bit of an understanding of where we're headed because um, I'm going to hit spot hit most of these. So start with me in chapter 5. I want you to look at the first three verses. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you uh, that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to you, every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he, uh, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. 
Paul's repeated a couple of words here. He's um, he oh, said, uh, five, I'm sorry. What, what chapter? Uh, chapter five, verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God. Is what I find says as one of the Christians. Are you in Galatians? <laughs> no, I'm in Ephesians. <laughs> Although that's a good chapter. Okay. <laughs> it's, the the it's March 13th. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, did I explain to you what a hemorrhagic stroke was? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, let's talk a little bit about what he's saying here. First of all, freedom in Christ. Um, th- that verse, by the way. Um, just look at verse 1. Uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. If you had to pick one verse in the entire book that typifies everything that goes on in Galatians, it would be this verse. It basically says, don't go back to the old ways of the law. You have been, you have been saved through grace by, G- by the death of Jesus Christ. So if you wanted to take a verse, if anybody ever asked you, what's the verse that you want from Galatians? That's going to be the verse. It says, stand firm in the freedom of Christ. So Paul starts his practical teaching in these last two chapters by summarizing everything that's gone before and now transitioning to what's going to fall. And he makes this point that freedom is from the yoke of the law. All, everything he's dealt with so far has been uh, on the point of the Judaizers saying what? Jesus and. Um, Jesus plus. Jesus and circumcision. Jesus and following the feast days. Jesus and something else. There is no Jesus and. That's the point he's making. And then he says, stand firm. And the, uh, it's Paul's way of saying, follow the gospel, which you've been taught. You're free from sin as Christ has paid the penalty. So he taught that, uh, call it a year and a half, two years earlier, in his first Galatian journey. And we've looked at this so many times, you probably have it uh, mapped in your mind. In his first Galatian journey that you'll see in the red, that was the period that he spent with, and I'm going to continue to make the point that it's the southern Galatian churches. We've never been really had northern Galatian churches named in any of the epistles or gospels. We know they existed because of some of the later church writings that talk about areas in northern Galatia. But this is the, what's called the southern Galatia theory, which is uh, Perga, Lystra, Antioch, Iconium, Derbe, and then he just kind of repeats the the route. He just goes back through the same route. He's going to go through here at least two times, probably three, kind of reinforcing the churches. So Paul says, stand firm. And it's his way of saying, you know the gospel. You've heard the gospel. Now, why would you do something outside the gospel? So stand firm. And then in verse 2 and 3, the Judaizing teachers in Galatia were urging believers to be circumcised. Now, again, Paul focuses on that because that's the clearest sign of trying to return to the law that we, go, we can go all the way back to Genesis 17 to find. But the reality is where it really shows up in the law is not until, it's not made part of the law. It's a, a sign of, uh, circumcision is a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God. It's not made part of the law until we get into Levit- Leviticus 14 or 400 years later. In Leviticus, I think it's chapter 12, it says, you shall be circumcised on the eighth day. That's where it becomes part of the law. But that's what the Judaizers are saying. Look, in order to be in our select group, in order to be in this group uh, that's going to be saved, you've got to have Jesus Christ and him crucified, which they believe. Don't make the mistake that the Judaizers are what I would call Orthodox Jews. The Judaizers are people who have said, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Likely many of them coming from Acts chapter 2 on the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But then, then, then they've said, well, wait just a minute. Yes, that's true. We have been saved by Jesus Christ, but we still got to do these pieces of the puzzle. It wasn't just circumcision. As we learned last week, they began to observe many of the feast days. Now, when I say they began... Almost all of the verb tenses that we've had so far, when it's related to the Galatians, are future verb tenses. In other words, you have not yet, but you are going to. 
That would be the verb tense in Greek. So Paul's at a point now where he can intercede and still kind of save the day in terms of there's no reason to go back to this, um, this circumcision or this Jesus Christ plus anything. So Paul points out that uh, being circumcised changes the entire orientation of salvation away from God's grace to one's own actions. Um, now, one who is circumcised in an attempt to gain God's acceptance is obligated to keep the whole law. Did you notice what he said in verse, I think it's in verse 2 or 3. Mark my words. Um, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the entire law. So what's he, what he's saying here is, look, um, circumcision was a sign between God and Abraham and Jews. Not a, not a sign between God and Abraham and anybody else, but between God and Jews. Paul probably continued to, to practice everything that was in the law, not because it had anything to do with the salvation, but because he had years of, uh, 2,000 years of history of doing that. So he's saying, look, it's not that. Um, that's going to have anything to do with your salvation. So why would you bother to do it? Uh, why would you bother to keep the law? And if you're going to keep the law, his argument here is, if you're going to say, okay, I need to be circumcised and I need to keep the feast days, well, then you've got to keep all other 613 of those. Well, um, it's not circumcision that's so important. In fact, if you recall, Paul has Timothy circumcised. That was a matter of expediency, which we've talked about before. Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman, which, uh, a, uh, which is, uh, according to matriology, made him Jewish by blood. So he was circumcised, not for the sake of circumcision, but for expediency. Paul needed him to be able to go into the synagogues just like Paul had, did, had done without him. And Paul's going to be sent on a number of missionary journeys by Paul to do, I mean, Timothy, to do his work in a number of areas. So the whole reason for circumcision of Timothy didn't have anything to do with the law. What it had to do with is you can't get access to a synagogue or to any Jewish group unless you are. So it was, that wasn't the issue. The issue was that Paul, uh, what Paul condemns is what I'm going to call the theology of circumcision, which makes works necessary for salvation. Now, you might say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't really have anything to do with today's churches. Let me give you a couple of examples of something very similar to that in today's churches. One is you have to be able to speak in tongues before you are truly saved. There are at least a dozen different Christian denominations that will teach that. Let me give you a second one. Oh, well, you better keep these feast days and you better show up for church services on these times because if you don't, you can lose your salvation. So we might think that Paul's saying all of this to an audience 2,000 years ago. That audience, that audience is here today in our churches in terms of Jesus Christ plus anything else. Um, that brings us to our second item, obey the whole law. Uh, let's just look at verses all four through uh, probably eight or nine or, or wherever I stop reading. Um, you are trying to be justified by law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's probably a good place to start because then he's going to move to a, a, an analogy that he uses. Paul uses uh, athletic analogies a lot in his writings. He's going to move to that in verse 7. In verse 4, go back to fallen from grace, um, that's understood by some to refer to the loss of salvation. However, fallen from may refer to an attitude or to the message that it communicates rather than to it, their eternal salvation. In other words, to choose legalism is to relinquish grace as the principle 
which, by which allows one to be related to God. So what he's saying here is, if you're going to adopt this, then that means that you are automatically saying, somehow the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not sufficient for my grace. Somehow there had to be something more. Somehow that death on the cross and the resurrection was insufficient grounds for you to be saved. But then he gets to, in verse 5, gets to my favorite word. You guys are going to get so sick of this, but, and I made the case yesterday in Master's Men, it is the biggest word in the Bible, but, and notice what he says in verse 5, but by faith. The message of the gospel is now brought forward in the last full statement of the principle of justification by faith in this letter. This is the last time Paul's going to make that point. You are justified by faith. He's probably going to make it a number of more times kind of implicitly, but he's going to say it here. You are justified only by faith, no other action. So up to this point, Paul's been talking only uh, of the Galatians, and notice the pronoun you, warning them about what they seem to be doing. Now he's going to change to we, emphasizing something more like this. But on the other hand, we Christians do not choose legalism, Rather, we wait in faith through the Spirit for the full realization of God's righteousness. I'm going to read that again, and I'm going to give it attribution because I'm not smart enough to think of these kind of things. Pardon? What verse was that? Uh, we're in verse 5. Okay. But here's um, the NIV, I'm sorry, the Expositor's Bible commentary does what I'd call a paraphrase of that. And here's, what, here's the paraphrase. But on the other hand, we Christians do not choose legalism. Rather, we wait in faith through the Spirit for the full realization of God's righteousness. So he's applied that, uh, Eileen, to verse 5, saying all that is, doesn't make any difference because it really comes down to this and this alone, by faith. It's the last time he's going to use that argument in his letter. <clears throat> He'll refer to it a number of times, but the last time he's going to say it. And then in, in verse 6, Paul's going to make two final points, and he wraps up kind of the first half of, of this section. <coughs> Excuse me. And here's what he's going to say. Um, look in verse, chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So... Um, He's, Paul's going to make two points, and he comes, this is the closest he probably comes to giving a full definition of true Christianity. Here's the first point. As hard as Paul uh, has been on circumcision, and as much as it would serve his purpose to downgrade it in preference to uncircumcision, he nevertheless acknowledges that neither one of them have any effect. It doesn't make any difference whether you are or whether you are not. Grace overrides both of those. So I don't care whether you are Jew or Gentile, it makes no difference. The second point he says is this, true faith, having an ethical side, works itself out through love. This is what matters, this kind of faith. To believe is to place one's personal confidence in Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. Therefore, Christians must respond in a genuine and self-denying love for others. Let me read that verse again is also one of the most critical verses probably in the book. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision has any value. That's his first point. Here's his second point. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Next week, when we get to the law of Christ, the law of Christ that's going to be the principal law of Christ. He's saying circumcision doesn't make any difference. Following the feast days doesn't make any difference. Following the 613 commandments, uh, don't make any difference. The only thing that makes difference is faith, expressing itself through love. Where do you find any more expression of love than the willing sacrifice of someone saying, I'm willing to hang on the cross a terrible death for the sins of all mankind? You won't find it any other place. So Paul says, why do you need this paltry little stuff? Why do you need the minutia to even have anything to do with the sacrifice of somebody who said, I'm taking your sin with me. I want to nail it to the cross with me. Uh, by the way, I want you to notice in verses 5 and 6, the three great terms, faith, hope, and love, appear together. Um, if, you ever, if you want a good treatment of that, you need to go to 
1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is what I call the love chapter. It's where Paul is going to spend uh, the whole period of time saying, if you have all of these but you have not love, you are nothing but a clanging symbol. Then Paul's going to shift a little bit, and in chapter, in beginning in verse 7, he's going to shift to a different uh, expression for what he's going to talk about to the Galatians. So start with me in cha- uh, chapter 5, verse 7, and let's read probably, yeah, let's read through uh, verse 12. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? What kind of persuasion does not come from, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you? A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense Uh, of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. If you have a different version, you're going to get a different word than emasculate. What Paul's saying is, why stop at circumcision? Why not do the whole thing? We'll come back to that. I'm sure you're looking forward to that part. Look at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, you ran well. Now the Galatians' splendid start At this point, when Paul was there preaching to them, starting the race of the Christian life had not continued, or is in danger, I guess I should point that out, of not continuing. Their detour into legalism was certainly not God's will. And then he says, who led you there? Well, we know exactly what he's talking about, don't we? And in verse 9 and 10, he refers to them. He says that they leaven everything. Well, leaven symbolizes the intruders, the false teachers, and the false doctrine and their sinister influence. They were taking the gospel of free forgiveness away from the Galatians, the one, uh, so the one who causes the harm will experience God's judgment. You've probably seen leaven or yeast used a lot in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It typically meant to cause something to, if you add a little yeast to something, it's like having one bad apple. If you have one bad apple, it spoils a whole bunch. The same concept. But yeast, mostly in the New Testament, or any kind of leaven, is usually reckoned as sin. In other words, once it starts, it's going to permeate. So Paul's saying, how could these guys get in and plant a little bit of yeast that's now caused you to get to this point? And then he says in verse 11, um, well, let's read that. <coughs> Hold on one second here. Um, brothers, by the way, you can tell the tone change here, can't you? From the beginning of the book, it was like, what's wrong with you Galatians? Well, in the last few chapters, what have we heard? Brothers, brothers, brothers. And then in the New Testament, it, that can only be used one of two ways. Actually, one of three ways. One is Philadelphia love for brother, or philos, which means literally brother to brother. One is um, the concept of a Christian brother. In other words, regardless of our backgrounds, Jeff, we have brotherhood in one thing, and that's the death of Jesus Christ. The last way it can be used is brothers in terms of Judaism. In other words, you can be from any one of the 12 tribes, you are still considered a brother because you come from Father Abraham, through Isaac, and through Jacob. So those are the three ways it's used. Paul's using it here in terms of brothers in Christ. And he started to pick that up more and more now that he is trying to teach them what the difference is and what they're trying to do. And then he says in verse 11, um, Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. What he's talking about when he says the offense of the the cross, uh, it's offensive because it proclaims God's unmerited grace. In other words, there is no place left for any kind of works. Do you follow me? When he says it's the offense of the cross, he's really saying this is unmerited grace. There is nothing left for you to say in terms of your salvation. You can't claim anything. Therefore, it is offensive to some. In this case, he's probably still kind of 
jabbing the Judaizers. And then he gets to verse 12. Uh, let me see. Who's got... Uh, Tony, what version do you have? King James. Good. Let's see if it says it there. Read King James chapter 5, verse 12. I would they were even cut off, which is trouble you. Well, that wasn't much better. Anybody have castrate? Because that's what Paul's saying. I have the New American Standard, which is the closest. <laughs> okay. So, Jeff, you read it out of the non-authorized Bible that Ernie says he'll, he'll read out of the authorized Bible. What does yours say, Jeff? Sorry, which verse is it? 12. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 12. Galatians. <laughs> Ephesians? What? Ephesians. <laughs> I wish those agitators would go so far as to castrate themselves. Ooh, yeah. So Paul, what Paul is really saying, he doesn't, pull, doesn't mince words, does he? He's saying, look, if you guys think that circumcision is all right, then why don't you just do the whole thing? That couldn't, isn't that going to be better? Well, Paul doesn't pull many punches, especially when he's trying to make the point that you are saved by grace and grace alone. That's going to bring us to our next kind of... Um, bullet point here, and that's the big word antinomianism. Lynn, what did you learn? Anything? So um, antinomianism, and I'll, we'll do another definition because I'm not sure we picked up your voice on the recording, so I'll do a definition of it, but it's exactly what you just said. Anti meaning against, nomos meaning law, against the law. So I'll pick that up here in just a minute. So um, antinomianism is exactly what we're going to talk about in the next few verses, which is freedom doesn't necessarily mean license. Paul's made this whole case all along, hasn't he, that you don't need the law, you need grace. Well, that led to a couple of problems. One was, okay, if I don't need the law, then I am free to go do whatever I want to, right? I can always go to confession on Saturday. A little humor there. So um, that's the point that Paul is making, and it's going to lead to some other issues, not necessarily Paul's writing, but some thoughts on antinomianism is going to lead to something called Gnosticism, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. So look at verses, I want to read verses 13 through 15, and Paul's going to deal with this. Here's what he's going to say. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but... Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So one of the arguments by the Galatians or by the Judaizers to the Galatians is, well, if we don't have the law, if we don't have the 613 requirements of the law, then we're free to go, you're, you're saying that we're free to go do anything. Well, Paul's arguing against that by saying, no, you're not free to go do anything because by the letter of the law or by the love of the law, you're required to act out of the best interest towards your brother. 
So he's going to set this argument aside by saying, look, they're wrong when they say if you don't have the law, the law is what's going to guide you in order of your moral, the way you deal with people morally, ethically, etc. That's not the law that's going to do that. It's going to be the law of love. We're going to make the case next week that that's what is called the law, the law of Christ. So freedom, in this case, Paul's going to say is not licensed. So he's already spoken, Paul's spoken of freedom several times in his letter. This is one of his central themes, but up to here, he's not really defined it, or at least not in practical terms of dealing with the ethical life. Now he does, uh, showing uh, not only what the true nature of Christian freedom is, but also that only through the Spirit and by the Spirit's power can Christians live for God and not fulfill the desires of their sinful nature. Lynn did a good job on, um, you'll get an A for today's class, on her homework assignment for antinomianism. And I'm going to give you first a negative and then a positive of, uh, of this argument. Here, negatively first. Antinomianism, it comes from, it's actually a Greek compound word. A lot of the, comp, a lot of the words in uh, Greek are compound words. In other words, they've taken two words and combined them comes from the term anti, meaning against, and nomos, meaning the law. So antinomianism means against the law. uh, Theologically, antinomianism is the belief that there are no moral laws God expects Christians to obey. That would be the negative side of it. Positively, it is service both to God and to other people and expresses itself in, in great Christian values. So back to, and then we're gonna get back to the point counterpoint argument, verses 13 through 18, describes the works of the spirit, while verses 19 through 21 describes the works of the flesh. Paul's whole point here is, there is still a law, but it is not the 613 laws of the Old, of the old Testament, it is the law of love for, for your brother. And he's gonna make that case, again in chapter six, by citing, first of all, what's the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. What's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the point that he's making. You are still under the law, but you are under the law of love for your neighbor because the working of the Holy Spirit is required that of you. Not required. That's probably the wrong word. As a, is instilled that in you. <clears throat> so... Um, so he makes the case both positively and negatively. In verses 13 through 18, he describes the work of the Spirit, while verses 19 to 21 describe the works of the flesh. So let's look at verses 13 through 18. Um, and let's see here. And that we're going to deal partly when we get to verse beginning in verse 16 by living by the Spirit. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. In other words, if you continue to keep these laws, you're going to continue the 613 requirements of the covenant of the Old Testament covenant, you're going to continue to find problems with Tony and problems with Lynn and lots of problems with Ernie. Sorry, Ernie, you're, you're just so easy. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so that's his point is the law of love does not allow that while the law of the Sinai, the covenant of the Sinai would. And then we get to the, our next bullet point here, live by the Spirit. And that's going to be the last half of this chapter. Here's what he's going to say. So, I say, after all that, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In other words, you're living by the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, or the law of love, or the law of Christ, not the sinful law, or not the law that you've been freed from, and as a result, you can go do whatever you want to. That's the point he's making. You can't go do whatever you want to because if you're looking out for the best interests of your brother, you're not going to do any of the things that would harm your brother or yourself. So he's going to go on and say, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. You notice we're back in the (coughs) point-counterpoint argument. And the spirit, what is contrary to sinful nature. 
They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then in verse 19, he's going to describe the sinful acts beginning in verse 19. So let's deal with these few verses beginning in verse 13 first. Liberty presents an opposite temptation from legalism. A person can be tempted to view freedom in Christ as a selfish opportunity for the flesh. Paul's going to use the term sarks here for flesh, which we're going to, <laughs> we're going to flesh out here in just a minute. Oh, sometimes I'm just so witty. Um, in other words, an opportunity to do whatever one wants to do. But Paul points out that true Christian liberty is the freedom to serve one another in love. And he's going to go back to verses 5 and 6. He says, if, if you want to experience true freedom, let me tell you what true freedom is. True freedom is having the ability to go help Ian do a chore up at his house or to help someone else with a problem that they've got or to take somebody to church every week that can't normally get there. That's the freedom that is allowed by the Spirit. <coughs> and in verse 14, the Christian does not live under the law of Moses but instead under the law of Christ. As I said, we'll come back to that in chapter 6. Living in Christ empowers us to love others, which is the fulfillment of the law. <coughs> One of the things we'll look at next week is the summary of the law and the prophets in Matt, from Matthew when we deal with this issue of the law of Christ. And finally, in verse 15, when Christians follow their sinful desires, they begin to criticize and to contend with one another. Such self-centered uh, behavior is self-defeating. Those who criticize and attack usually end up being consumed in worthless struggles. In other words, he's saying, <coughs> and if your attitude is such that, well, you need to follow this law and this law and this law and this law, it's just a matter of time before you're going to say, well, Kathleen, I saw you dancing the other night. Don't you know where that's going to take you? That's, that's what's going to happen. When Paul says, on the other hand, I look forward to, he says, I look forward to helping my brother through these issues. That's the true law of love. You don't need 613 commandments. You only need two. On, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Love your brother as yourself. And that brings us to... Uh, living in the Spirit or life in the Spirit in verses 16 through 18. <coughs> um, let me just touch on those quickly. Uh, so I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The only consistent way to overcome sinful desires of the human nature, uh, the flesh, is to live step by step in the power of the Holy Spirit as he works as he works through our spirits. Um, you'll notice here our term, shall not. Look in verse 16. I say to you, live by the Spirit, and you will not or shall not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's a striking promise. Walking each moment by faith in God's word under the Spirit's control assures absolute victory over desires of our sinful flesh. And then in verse 17, there's the contrast between actually between sarx and pneuma so sarx is the flesh pneuma is spirit that's where the term actually means a wind or a breeze uh, in both hebrew and greek actually the term ruah in hebrew and pneuma in greek means spirit but the literal definition is as a breath or as a wind uh, and you might recall in acts chapter 2 what happens to uh, the apostles and everyone around them. A wind blows through. That's the Holy Spirit, as opposed to sarks, the flesh. So um, Paul's going to make this case, and we'll, de we'll define sarks here in just a minute, that living by the Spirit, living through the Spirit, does not allow one to live by the flesh, and that the sinful nature does no good and does not desire good, whereas the Spirit does no evil and indeed opposes evil. Now, let me tell you a problem that's going to raise. I just kind of set up the difference between 
the body and the spirit, right? Well, what's going to happen? And you're going to see it. You see a little bit of it in some of, John, uh, some of Paul's writings, a little bit of it in some of Peter's writings. Paul's going to deal with it uh, later on in some of his later writings. Where you really see it for the first time is in 1 John, John's first letter. And the first, John's first letter is likely written 95 AD. So that means it's uh, 40 years, <clears throat> 50 years after what we're seeing here. John's going to deal with Gnosticism for the first time, but Gnosticism has already had its seed planted. And here's what Gnosticism did in the first century. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a bunch of forms of Gnosticism, but here's probably two, and this is probably all you ever read to, need to know about Gnosticism. It was false teaching, and the term Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis, which in Greek means knowledge. And what that meant was you had to have some superior knowledge. In other words, it wasn't just Jesus Christ and him, and him crucified. You had to have some kind of ethereal knowledge over and above that. That's what Gnosticism was. It took a number of forms, but the two most common were the two I have on the board here, Docetism and Serinthianism. So this concept of everything to do with the body is bad and everything to do with the soul is good meant that Jesus Christ could not have been both man and God at the same time because he inhabited an earthly body. So the Docetus taught that, um, that it, he really didn't inhabit that body. It was an appearance. It comes from the word dokeo in Greek, which means to seem to be. So the Docetus taught Jesus never really existed in the flesh. He was only this kind of ethereal image that somehow was able to move around the world. Now, according to Docetism, Jesus Christ only seemed to have a human body like ours. I don't know how they explain the crucifixion, but I'll tell you how Serinthianism explains the crucifixion. Serinthianism says the same thing, which is basically the body has to be bad, the soul can be good. Serinthianism explains it this way that prior, and I think I've explained this to you before, prior to uh, Christ's baptism, that um, Christ did not inhabit the body of Christ. His spirit did not inhabit it. It's not until baptism, when he comes up out of the water and God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, that the spirit of Christ is infused into the body. And according to Serenthius, uh, who taught this, uh, Serenthianism, according to him who taught it, for the three and a half years that Christ was on the earth at that period of time, he, in, he lived in that body, but before the crucifixion, he somehow was able to, to leave the body, and his spirit left, leaving only, this, only the body. So it was not Jesus Christ crucified, it was just the body of Jesus Christ crucified. I feel bad for the poor schmuck who's left with the body. The point is that Gnosticism said, but partly because Paul makes such a good job, does such a good job, now I can't blame Paul for doing this, does a good job of separating sarx, which is body, and he's the only one who really does this explicitly, and soul, which is uh, the living, breathing nature of man, does such a good job of it that, that Gnostics would later go on and say, well, if it has anything to do with the body, it can't possibly be good. By the way, that also gave them license to do whatever they wanted to. Because they said, oh, it's not me, it's my body doing it. It's not my soul, my soul doesn't want to do this. Oh, it's my body doing this. Gave them a certain amount of license as well. And so, is, And this is what we get, agnostics. Uh, to some degree. Agnostics, uh, the actual term agnostic simply means that truth, truth is not known and cannot be known. In other words, you cannot prove, you cannot know that that, ex that happened or not. So agnostics is a slightly different term, but the same concept, Ernie. You can't possibly know this. Ag meaning against knowledge. It just means you can't possibly know this. Very different from an atheist who says, I do know that there is no God, and an agnostic says, I don't know if there is or not. Um, so, door number three. Yeah, door number three. Um, now, let's deal with uh, not by flesh and then we'll finalize on fruit of the spirit. In verses 19 to 21, the works of the flesh, and if you read through them, you'll get a pretty good idea of what they're talking about here. Well, no, you won't get a good idea, I'll tell you. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, 
impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, keep in mind, I want to make sure you understand that these, what Paul is writing, to, writing 2,000 years ago has absolutely no relevance to today. Did you listen to the list? Did you listen to the list we just read? Don't you see that in virtually everything going on in our society today? That's why Paul's letters, and the reason we're doing this, is Paul's letters can be taken from 2,000 years ago and dropped right into our laps today. <laughs> so the works of the flesh include but are not limited to and go well beyond the destructive and contentious jealousies portrayed in verse 15 where there's such behavior as positive proof that the person is not living by the power of the Holy Spirit, but by Satan. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, sarx um, is the Greek word uh, for flesh. Now in Greek literature, the word sarx usually just meant nothing more than the human body. So it wasn't a particularly onerous issue. Um, it was also used this way in the New Testament. John will talk about it, Revelation talks about it. Paul gives it a whole different reading though. With Paul, he uses the word to denote the entire fallen human being, not just the sinful body, but the entire being. In other words, when Paul says sarks, he's talking about the entire fall, fallen nature. So, Jeff? How do you spell sarks? S-A-R-X. Um, <clears throat> he's talking about, and Paul's the one who does this more than anyone. Paul will, on a number of occasions, he's going he's gonna to contrast sarks, and pneuma, pneuma being spirit, P-N-E-U-M-A, P-N-E-U-M-A. It's where we get our, our, uh, all of our terms for pneumatic, uh, pneumatics or uh, pneumococcal or any of those kinds of terms comes from this concept. Pardon? I said pneumonia. Pneumonia. Well, that's actually a very good one because pneumonia is lack of breath. So that's a good point. Finally, the fruit of the spirit. Uh, in the last few verses. I want to read what the expositors has to say about the fruit of the Spirit. And if I had to find anything, people will say, well, what does it mean to be Christian? If I had to find anything that I would say, this should tell you whether you are Christian or whether Christian, uh, the Christian life exists in others. Here's what the expositors, we've talked... We've used this a lot. This happens to be the 12 volume set. There is a, and I've used it several times, there's an abridged set, which I think is just two books, and it may be first in, uh, Old and New Testament, can't tell you. Look that thick. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they weigh 800 pounds. So um, I've used this a lot. There's a number of other resources I've used. Next week, when we kind of wrap things up, I'll give you kind of a bio. bio bibliography of what all those are, but here's what they say. Um, the term works, erga, that's where we get our term ergonomic, already has, been, has definite over, uh, overtones in Paul's letter. It refers to that which man can do, which in the case of the works of the law has already been shown to be inadequate. The fruit of the spirit, on the other hand, suggests that which is a natural product of the spirit rather than of man, made possible by the living relationship between the Christian and God. The singular form stresses that these qualities are a unity, like a bunch of grapes instead of separate pieces of fruit, and also that they are all, all, to, be found, that they are all to be found in all Christians. Uh, in, in this, they differ from the gifts of the Spirit, which are given to individuals. So here we're not talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, etc. These should be found in all Christians. And I want to point, I'm going to read the nine virtues, and I'm going to tell you what, what, uh, what Expositors has to say about the nine. So start with me in... Start with me with the biggest word in the Bible in verse 22, but... He's already talked about the fruit of, this, of the flesh, hasn't he? And uh, every sin that you could possibly imagine there. Now he's going to say, but. Well, but what? But the fruit of the Spirit, and I want you to listen to these, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, um, I'd like to say all of us have all of those in, in spades. We don't. I can Sometimes. tell you I don't. Pardon? Sometimes, at times. Well, at times, that's right. Uh, and it should not be that we have all of those because that is part, that's part of the process called sanctification of the three pieces of salvation. You can only be justified once. That's when you say Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That's justification. You can only go to glory once. That's glorification. You can only die once. That's glorification. Everything in between is called sanctification. And that is a process that begins the minute you say Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and continues until glorification. All of these, we would hope, would be present more and more and more and should be what we strive for. Let me tell you what we'll end here today. Let me tell you what the uh, commentary uh, Expositor's commentary says, the nine virtues uh, that are the Spirit's fruit hardly need classification, though they seem to fall into three categories of three each. And I'm going to give you the categories. And I'll tell you, this is just a theory, but I think a pretty good one. Um, the, first, uh, the first three appear to comprise Christian habits of mind in their more general aspects. And then they quote uh, theologians saying their primary directions is God word. The second three set primarily the concerns the Christian, uh, the, primarily concerns the Christian in his relationship to others and our social virtues. And the final three concern the Christian as he is to be in himself. So if you go read through those virtues again, there will be some who separate them into the, all of which you should attempt to continue, but they'll separate them into your relationship with God, your relationship with man, and the, your relationship with what yourself is. So look at them and just again. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, that would be with God. Patience, kindness, goodness, that would be with fellow man. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that would be within yourself. So... Paul's point in all of this is, wait a minute, there is a law. It's the law of love. It's the law of Jesus. That's the law to which you were bound the minute you said Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. It has nothing to do with the law of the Sinai. Um, by golly, we're done. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs> well, Lynn said it loud enough for everybody, so... Uh, Mr. Goble, unless there's any, anybody have questions first? Maybe a comment. Okay. I think circumcision of the heart is what's important. I agree. As, as opposed to the flesh. It's, yep, it's I agree. And you can get that as far back as Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 31, mm -hmm. you know, 500 years before Christ. You got, you have to pray before you can leave. <laughs> I know what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs>